Chris. I'm pleased to say that uh, both of our speakers have recently published in the National Interest website on the very topic <laughs> that we are discussing today. And it's one that uh, has gradually started to pique my interest because it's on the front pages of the Washington Post, New York Times, and other publications. And there's a piece today in uh, Bloomberg saying that the United States is losing to Russia and China and Africa. And so I thought that this would be a propitious moment to look at this issue with Mark Lagon, who I've known for several decades now, actually more than several decades. And he is uh, a close friend of mine. Uh, we first met in, in college. And uh, he has had a uh, career that is somewhat vertiginous in its, in its political uh, shifts, moving from being a staffer for Jesse Helms now, I think, to no longer being a member of the Republican Party and is chief policy officer of the Friends of the Global Fight Against AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. And on my left, not politically, is J. Peter Pham, who is a distinguished fellow at the Atlantic Council, where I'm also a fellow, and a former special envoy to the region. So I thought we would kick it off with Peter, and then we'll go to Mark. And then I'll post a few questions. And then I'd love it if all of you who know far more than I do about this subject will hurl a multitude of questions <laughs> at our speakers today. Peter, please take it off. OK, well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Jacob, for this invitation, this opportunity. See many friends uh, in the room who also know a great deal. So look forward to the conversation uh, uh, that we'll have on this. Uh, Happy to be here. Uh, long been a reader for many years since I was a college student myself of the national interests and uh, have had uh, the privilege and the pleasure of contributing from time to time over those years uh, in the print edition and online. Um, today's topic, great power rivalry in Africa, I thought give a few minutes just to go over my basic thesis is that uh, whether we realize it or not, in the last several years, I would say four, uh, the, the, sh the shape and the contours of great power rivalry in Africa have shifted significantly. And very often I find myself speaking with people who are still playing by the old rules uh, of the game and not the rules that are now in place. And it's dramatically different. Uh, for those who follow Africa closely, number in the room, uh, I apologize. I just want to throw out some numbers and statistics uh, for those who aren't uh, uh, drinking the Kool-Aid of Africa uh, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis or breathing that, that air on why this is important, uh, why it's now on the front page and should have been a long time ago. Uh, first, economic interests. Uh, here we talk, scary, but let's start with economics. Uh, just if you look at the uh, countries that the IMF in those revised or expect to have the greatest economic growth, uh, not just this year, this decade, half of them are African countries. And that's not new. That's been more or less uh, the countries change from time to time. But if you look over a intermediate span of time, uh, Africa is where the growth is. Part of that is driven by commodity prices, obviously. But part of it is also demographics. By 2050, not that far away, one in four working age persons on this planet is going to be an African. That's a great opportunity for a demographic dividend. It's also a great challenge if there's not uh, something to do for those people. Uh, speaking of commodities, obviously, the continent has roughly one third of the mineral resources of the planet. <clears throat> but it has disproportionate amounts of specific resources. Uh, cobalt, for example, uh, key to uh, all sorts of modern technology, uh, not least uh, uh, our mobile devices and, and uh, uh, batteries. Uh, half, uh, roughly half of the world's total reserves are in one country. 
the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, of those, uh, yet in terms of production, uh, slightly less than 75% uh, of the actual production of cobalt comes from that one country alone. Uh, you add in Madagascar into it, and uh, two countries, you've got well over 80% of the production on the planet. Uh, just one here. Uh, Congress, as one explorer said in the 19th century, it is a geological scandal. Uh, last year, it moved ahead of uh, Bolivia to be the second largest copper producer in the world. Uh, if we're going to have an energy transition for those, uh, we're going to need copper, lots of copper. We're going to need to mine in the next 15 years as much copper as humanity has mined since the dawn of time. Uh, where is it going to come from? Bolivia's production has collapsed. Cadelco in Chile is going down. Within the decade, Congo is going to be the world's largest producer of copper as well. And one can go on and on with other critical minerals, but uh, I think the point's made. Uh, and of course, great power competition enters into this, not just in uh, hard power, but in access to minerals and the stuff of which we will make tomorrow. Uh, just stick to stick with the uh, the cobalt example. The Democratic Republic of Congo uh, production of three quarters of the world's cobalt. Uh, for Fourteen of the nineteen uh, uh, largest cobalt mines are Chinese controlled or financed, and with a transaction currently in, uh, in the pipeline, that will soon be fifteen of nineteen. Um, now. I say the rules have changed. Uh, what has changed? First, uh, in terms of their power competition, countries now have options. Uh, with the entrance of not just China, but in recent years, Russia uh, into the mix, and regional uh, 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 powers, uh, the Turkeys, Saudi Arabias, uh, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, uh, there are all sorts of options. It's no longer what is said in Washington here, or in Brussels, or Paris, or London. There are uh, a variety of options. And if we uh, need an illustration of that, there is, and with apologies to friends from the State Department, the fact that the country that's at the rock bottom of the Human Development Index in the world, Niger, uh, felt it uh, was empowered to tell the US to get out of uh, the two air bases that were constructed over the course of the last decade and last months. Uh, uh, that has shifted, uh, for it being. Second point I would make is not only do they have choices, but in making choices, we have to listen uh, to what choices they're making. They're going to prioritize their, the African countries, their priorities as they perceive them, uh, rather than what we uh, necessarily dictate as priorities. Uh, we've graded long-term programs, uh, development assistance, uh, long-term structural reform for those take time. Many of these regimes seek immediate gratification. Now, one can argue the principle and the theory of which is better for the country in the long term, but the fact is uh, they're going to, they, they have options to satisfy the immediate uh, trade-offs. Uh, last year, I, I met with one of the... Uh, heads of state or uh, in one of the countries in the coup belt, my old beat uh, Sahel, and uh, his comment stuck with me. Uh, and he said to me, he said, Peter, uh, it's all well and fine. I know what I would do if I was certain uh, I'd be here in five years or 10 years, uh, but I'm not sure I'll be here tomorrow. Uh, and so my choices are going to have to be based on that. And that stuck with me. Uh, so, uh, so uh, what, what do uh, new regimes seeking legitimacy uh, seek? First, regime security, uh, and secondly, legitimation. Uh, so uh, different factors there. On, that, on this point, again, to stick, I just stick with uh, some examples. Niger, look at what, after they invited us to move along, the United States, uh, partnership with Russia, what they got delivered from Moscow, uh, an air defense system. Now, if you're the junta in Niamey, what are your threats? Uh, first, internal threats from even within the military. Uh, you might be overthrown by a rival general. 
uh, or secondly, of course, obviously, the uh, violent extremists there, neither of which are going to likely assault you from the air. An air defense system is not going to do you much good. Uh, what you need is perhaps some armored vehicles and training uh, for special forces. You're not going to need an air defense system against either the jihadist or a rival general. But so what good was the system? Well, it was a source of legitimation. Some foreign power, some great power, sent you a system. They could have sent God knows what they could have sent. Maybe they could have sent them a ship to a landlocked country, and it would have still been useful as a symbol of legitimation, not necessarily a tactical advantage that they're getting. Our third point uh, I would make is that it's not uh, just the regimes that are interested in priorities different from ours, and this is where we have to listen. Uh, and I, like my good friend, Dr. Zayn, who's, been, uh, who's always good at reminding all of us and about listening to Africa, I think it's very important. It's also the masses. The, the coups have occurred. We can condemn them all we want. And by the way, I'm all for it. When I was, uh, one coup took place on my watch, and uh, you know, I condemned it while it was taking place, bypassing the, uh, uh, the usual State Department. I figured better get my better have my knuckles wrapped than to be slow in condemning coups. So I condemned it on my personal Twitter account uh, while the thing was going through the process. These are being cleared, and I got the secretary to do likewise the following day. And then uh, 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 public PD caught up with us later. Uh, so not all against coups, but the fact is the reality is many of these coups are extremely popular. Is the populations themselves. Uh, are either afraid of violence or two, what came before coup isn't necessarily a democratic or legitimate government. Uh, classic case I would cite there is Guinea, where no one will ever convince me that the president who was overthrown in 2021 was ever democratically elected. Uh, can't convince me of that. There's no way mathematically that could have happened. Uh, it was a French result cooked up and so that. And finally, the final point I would make in the new great power rivalry of this is rather than the way out of this for the United States and for our allies, is rather than making it an us or them proposition, which is a fit, uh, will always lead to results we want, it's to try to make a better value proposition. Uh, what can we offer? What are their needs? What are the wants? What can we offer within the boundaries of what we can do resource-wise, <laughs> legally, and otherwise, and what can other partners we can bring along uh, offer that we can't, and a better value proposition. So I'll stop there and uh, uh, sort of an overview of what I think is this new uh, rivalry and the new rules of the road. Uh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you for those trenchant remarks, and now Mark um, will. Thank speak. you all for coming. I, I want to express that appreciation also to, to two good friends, Paul Saunders and, and Jacob. Thanks for inviting me. Um, but I'm especially happy to go second after Peter has, has given you um, his thinking and a few uh, statistics to chew on. I don't speak as an Africa specialist. Um, I've followed Africa uh, in jobs at the State Department and uh, as a scholar related to the UN. Um, I've looked at human rights issues, including as president of Freedom House in the past. I've worked in human rights, the sticky issues of human rights in bilateral relations when I was the US envoy on human trafficking. And in the last seven years, I happen to be working on AIDS, TB, and malaria as uh, emphases of US policy. And ha has, that's been very Africa focused and it's made me think about this issue. Um, Peter's right, I mean, you know, to start out thinking about um, the, the Chinese and Russian presence and, and um, the very real strategic problems for the United States. We have a tendency in our foreign policy across the political spectrum uh, to not articulate what our interests are uh, in, in Africa. And clearly, despite people knowing there's a great economic interest or geostrategic interest, I mean, it's a good heuristic device to look at the fact that the United States didn't until this year have a state visit of a leader um, from Africa since 2008, when Ruto came this year from Kenya. That means you know, the entire Obama and <clears throat> Trump eras did not include hosting a, a head of state in the United States. So why do we care or what do we want in this geopolitical situations? 
China is clear that it wants to extract resources, it wants to get political support from the Africans, whether it's in the UN or um, you know, access to bases. But it, it, let's get real. Let's think about some basic truths about the Chinese relationship with the Africans. Um, it is absolutely a strategic threat to the United States. Um, and, you know, a lot of us, I wrote in a piece for the national interest about China and Africa in uh, 2020, um, you know, let's keep in mind this, this oft-mentioned case of in a different region, Sri Lanka having put up strategic <coughs> territory for collateral and, and um, loans from the Chinese and then ending up having to give it up in the death trap. And perhaps um, no one in Africa will make that kind of mistake, but you know, uh, two ports in Kenya, including in my beloved Mombasa, and a railroad lead, funded by trying to lead you to wonder about how um, that leverage could be used. Uh, it's worth thinking about um, ways we've succeeded, either leaders in African countries like in Tanzania, um, when, when Hikalemo uh, replaced uh, Longu, sort of backing off from being too, too much uh, in debt or, or you know, in, in relationships with China, and how the United States ha has played a subtle role, for instance, in Tanzania, making sure that, you know, projects for a, a port, um, the Bagamoyo port, were actually India rather than China bankrolling. Um, I, I will say something that I, I don't know whether Peter agrees with or not, but I don't think we can successfully in our diplomacy with African countries say it's us or them with respect to China. They offer very real things, however difficult the debt um, trap is, however much the projects steer benefits to Chinese employees rather than nationals of African countries. It should not be our talking point to say, you got, you know, we need to be your patron instead of China. What we have to do that's more achievable is get into relationships there are equal value or maybe more value as opposed to <clears throat> punishing um, African countries when they do deals with China and Russia. Let's woo them with value. Um, we talk about competing with China um, in Africa. Well, let's really compete. Let's offer value um, it, 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 that, that equals um, the Chinese. Um, I just want to emphasize, and I did in the 2020 piece I did for Jacob, um, what some people call soft power, I prefer to call persuasive power, the non-kinetic elements of U.S. foreign policy. Um, we need to use them. We need to think about student visas for Africans to come to the United States, old-fashioned foreign visitor programs when you, you, know, you deal with young people and then they become very important leaders in and out of government not cutting the voice of America, but boosting it. Um, uh, I, I think we need to use global health, and I'll say a word to close on, on, on that as a comparative advantage of the United States. Um, but there is a question out, out there that I have in mind um, as a, a human rights guy, um, uh, which is how much do you stress human rights and governance? Do you um, form geopolitical relationships with the governments that are there and not, you know, have a light touch on human rights, or is a value-based foreign policy a strength rather than a weakness? I come down uh, in the latter view. I, I think we need to think about the people of Africa, not just the regimes that are in place. Um, offering a vision of civic participation, good governance, equality, transparency, these have an appeal to the people of Africa, especially this enormous youth demographic, this bulge. Um, and I, I think we should be more consistent. Thank you, Peter, for putting out your, your word on social media. I think we've been inconsistent about how we've applied the Section um, 708 coup restrictions, um, or that you know everyone seems to be, um, you know, to love Kagame who is a horrendous autocrat despite being a tremendous economic and health um, policy um, leader. Um, we need to partner with the African people, not just the governments. China has tended to co-opt elites. I mean, it, that's really colonial. I mean, you know, 
co-opting elites, we've tried to do the same and less effectively. Perhaps we should think also about offering things that are a model um, that are attractive uh, to the people and the <coughs> business community. Um, obviously, we should invest more in our diplomatic presence. Um, you know, I'm one who believes that we have very proper big investment in military assets and military relationships. But um, it's, it, it, it's not in our interest to underinvest in the diplomatic presence there. And let me end with health, which I work on now. I'm a chief flack for the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and uh, uh, malaria in town. The PEPFAR program <coughs> um, has saved over 25 million lives. Um, and there is significant reputational benefit that comes from that along with the Presidents of Malaria Initiative created two years later in the Bush administration as a bipartisan policy. The US funds one third of the Global Fund um, to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria, which is, with its partners like PEPFAR, responsible in the last 22 years for saving 59 million lives, many of which are in Africa. Health is something that we can use um, as a comparative advantage of the United States with our scientists with our medical profession, with our um, technology innovations, and a history over the last 20, 25 years of working deeply with partners on PEPFAR um, and, uh, and other programs. China does not offer life-saving health. However, it's actually branded itself. I mean, it has shown, to use a technical term, chutzpah, um, in the way it sold vaccines on the continent um, after having a hand in COVID-19's emergence, um, and then trying to get credit for that. Um, so, and our competitors, to mention Russia, um, they know that health assistance is one of our strongest tools. There's been documented evidence from the, you know, that the US government has um, gleaned that Russia has tried to target US health programs in Africa as something to create misinformation about. Um, so, in health, I've seen that they're frustrated with the vaccine nationalism. They, them thinking we and Western countries have taken care of ourselves before them. South Africa describes, uh, d d South African scientists discovered a deadly new strain of COVID-19, if you remember Omicron. Um, and then the countries of Southern Africa got um, a visa ban. Um, it, as a way of kind of congratulating them on finding uh, that kind of thing. We need to make sure we emphasize in health and otherwise relationships with people. Um, the governments of Africa want us to just hand them a, a, a check for national budget support for health. We shouldn't do that. We should keep programs that privilege a voice for civil society as well. Um, and so I'd say working with the African people um, projects a humane image of the United States and a model of open governance, which is different from the model of um, corruption that um, China diffuses. And I'd say there's an irony that the strategic policy of the United States will benefit from a focus on the African people's hopes and interests. Um, that will actually be one of the key considerations um, in an effective geostrategic policy on the continent. Wow, thank you, Mark. I did not expect you to go in this uh, inspiring direction. And uh, I'll, throw, I'll throw out the first question to our speakers and then uh, solicit them from all of you. How realistic is Mark's vision? When you look at the reporting right now, it says that the United States is on the back foot in Africa and are we, in fact, I was at a, an event last night with, with, that included a businessman, does a lot of work in the Middle East. And he said, let's face it, he said, I'm for American values, but the issue is I'm getting hammered when I go abroad because I have to adhere to the restrictions and stipulations that are set forth in the United States about how we work abroad and the values that we represent. He said, I'm fine with it, but it means I get my clock cleaned half the time when I'm, when I'm abroad. So are we in fact shooting ourselves in the foot in Africa or is there a positive path forward that's actually realistic? Well, uh, thank you, Jacob. Let me start with that very last question on 
uh, corruption, uh, because it's often perceived that you can't get things done without being corrupt. I, speaking from my one of my ha my hat as uh, corporate board director and uh, of a U.S. company doing business in Africa and chairman of another, actually, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act is one of the key protections. Uh, yes, there are cases where places soak up uh, that. It does set you at a disadvantage to be uh, that you can't pay bribes. But the question is, would you really want to do business there in such a place where there are no options? And, uh, and in fact, usually it's very, it's helpful to be. I'm an American company. We can't pay anything, uh, so don't ask. Uh, and increasingly, last year a very critical piece of legislation, which has yet yet been tested, but I think it's even better. It's the criminalization of the solicitation of an American company for a bribe. So now if you solicit, it's now, now not only is the burden on the American company not to pay uh, bribes, but if you solicit a foreign official, you're not, you can now, and the statute of limitations uh, is five years, and there's, you can argue with uh, con, uh, uh, if there's a conspiracy, it's tolling, so it could be extended, but at some point in the future, while you're transiting a friendly jurisdiction, uh, you might be pulled aside and put on a plane and find yourself in the Southern District of New York or perhaps over in uh, uh, Arlington facing US charges, uh, 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 felony charges. So uh, it actually is that, that equalizes the burden. Uh, it hasn't yet, people haven't quite figured it out yet, but I suspect that day is coming. But uh, as far as being, it's, we also have to provide, it's not just the values, and I agree with, uh, I fully agree with Mark, the values that we operate under, which are an advantage to America, but it's, uh, it's the whole ecosystem that we bring. Uh, yes, it's going to be costlier, but we, most American companies or Western companies engage the local communities, bring people into it, as opposed to importing you know, gang labor uh, on masse. It's not cost efficient for us to ship employees uh, over there. And in some cases, it is literally prison gang labor. Uh, so there are key advantages for, uh, to America. So I think we played our strengths. I fully agree with Mark. We, we do well by playing to our strengths. Uh, so it's not game over, but it's a tough game. And that's why I think the key to this is partners uh, in the international uh, community. We have to be pragmatic about our partners that we bring with us, because that's where the value proposition is going to come in. Uh, we don't have great amounts of capital to throw around. Uh, and even if we did, uh, in cases where we do have capital, it's the US government is dreadfully very slow. Uh, uh, we can talk about our development finance institutions and or uh, Exim and how long they take for things to, to happen. And this is where some of our partners do have comparative advantages, and uh, one should look uh, to them. Mark, do you want to weigh in? Well, I, I think you touch on something that's important is that we, we shouldn't try and be China. I mean, we shouldn't, despite DFC, we shouldn't try and emphasize infrastructure investment. We should play to our strengths. Some people would say we should have a statist policy and prop up our companies. I think actually that the government, the US government getting in heavily involved in the work of our companies has a real downside. Um, but you ask a question about, is this really practical? Are we going to be um, uh, you know, laughed out of the room if we suggest you, know, you get Western values, liberal values, um, if you have our economic investment or you align with us? You know, will they ask, well, your model isn't exactly impressive at home right now. Um, you know, you've had your own share of corruption in, in you know, Western um, or you know, liberal um, uh, liberal countries' governments, um, you've been battering us and inconsistent on, on human rights. But I, I do think um, it used to be there was something called the Washington Consensus, the, the formula of US aid, uh, US foreign aid, the World Bank and the IMF, that there were certain liberal norms or especially you know, structured um, open um, governance of economic affairs that were, and, and human rights conditionality to getting money from Western institutions in the United States. And then China was seen as having no strings. 
But the reality uh, for Africans is that there's a very complicated package that they get from China. And um, it might be that the openness proves to be an advantage, even if the current leaders of Africa manifestly um, would prefer to have the tools of maintaining their party's control. Uh, I think the first question or comment goes to Jamie Rubin, head of the Global Engagement Center, the State Department. I think I know what you want to, yeah. you want to jump in on the corruption issue. Well, almost, um, yes, but I also want to thank uh, Mark for mentioning our project, which was to reveal the Russian attempt to discredit Western medical practices. It was very, probably the most important thing. Daniel Cambridge is here with me. He's our deputy, uh, uh, and it's probably the most important thing we did this year because that was a case where disinformation was going to kill people. It was by deterring Africans from getting medical care, they were going to face uh, the potential of death. Um, what I want to ask you about, both of you, you know, there's the famous acronym GAN, Diplomacy, Information, Military, Economic. In the information domain, there is a debate about how to fight the war or whatever you want to call it to take the Russians and the Chinese on. And there's one school that says, all positive, you tell us, tell the Africans about our offer, how good it is, how successful it is, how effective it is. And there's another school that says, um, that we have to be more competitive in telling not only our story, but also discrediting uh, Russia and China's story. And each side claims to, to know which is better. I don't think it's entirely clear, and it's probably more of a case by case, but I would say the working hypothesis in this U.S. government right now is the first. Um, I personally work in fighting disinformation, so I'm likely to be on the side of the second. But I would just wonder if the two of you could comment on the question of how to engage in the information space. Is it better to be competitive or to just uh, be all be mostly positive about our offer and that by going to competitive messaging, you're putting them in an us or them situation as they are. Well, I don't mean, I don't want to come off as the, the weaker voice on you know, a geopolitical hard-headed approach, but I do, I do lean towards the former, towards telling our story especially since our story needs to be corrected or framed because there are some things about, you know, uh, the economic financial crisis of 2008 to 2010, the legacies of Afghanistan and Iraq, um, some hypocrisies on human rights, um, some backward movement on the liberal model within the United States. It's, it's good for us to tell our story about the offer, but also correct misinformation from the other side. Um, you know, lessons of the Cold War is you should, in fact, diss the other side. But I think it reinforces the notion, however true it is that, you know, our policy in Africa will be driven by geopolitical goals. We don't need to add to the look that that's the only thing we care about. Um, I think of all these countries who are our clients in, uh, in the Cold War, and then we just dropped them, like in Central America afterwards. It, it, it's good to actually invest in a relationship with, with Africa and telling our story. So Mark says we should invest, tell our story, draw the lessons of the Cold War. What's what's your take? I, I would agree that we should do that, but I would also have a measure on a case-by-case -case basis where it's useful to also do it subtly, if we can do it subtly, uh, uh, tell the, the negative side. Uh, I, I, uh, I, used to, uh, I always say, the best advertisement, actually, uh, we could we should encourage as many students as possible to take up chi scholarships to go to China, uh, because most of them will come back. And I've I've actually done the small focus groups with them. That most come back with fairly negative views. They've had, you know, if you're the child of a president or the niece of a minister, and you end up at uh, Beijing University or Xinhua, you've got wonderful. Play. But if you were shipped off to, you know, uh, someplace in Sichuan, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, I, I had dinner. Uh, it was just my wife and I and uh, the Chinese special envoy for Africa and his wife, uh, just for dinner. And he admitted to me over dinner that in at that time he was coming to the end of his his, tour, his term, and he said the whole time he'd been special envoy, he'd never once filled all the scholarships. 
uh, because they go back and they tell others, etc. So getting the negative story out but doing it artfully. The most impactful thing we actually could do is actually help train the journalists who will be telling the story. Uh, there, there are reams of data out there of uh, journalists who've been trained, gone to Chinese courses, and what they write after they come back. Uh, the engagements, the programs we're talking about, the visitors programs, etc. the train programs, you know, cameras provided, just a few little things. They don't take care of, but the, it's, it's quantifiable, that, that touch point of engagement. Uh, that, uh, and we don't do enough of that, quite frankly. I mean, we're, we're the budget to do that. And, you know, and if we can do a sophisticated campaign, if I underline the word several times, if we can do a sophisticated, uh, exposing things like Chinese racism. Uh, I mean, I, I know that uh, it's un, an uncomfortable topic and we've got our own history of that racism to about, but Chinese racism, I would argue, is far worse than uh, actually European or American racism when it comes to Africans. Uh, and I've worked in Africa my whole career, th you know, three decades now, and it's only been in the last decade where on the occasions where I'm not showing up as an official American or a VIP with the escort from courtesy of the president, they just think I'm just, I get mistaken for a Chinese businessman or something like that. And it's interesting, the night and day treatment. I've never, you know, the, uh, the pushback I've gotten uh, that I've never had in the first 20 years of my career, I've gotten in various places because they have been saying, in one, in one place they upgraded me after I found I was an American. They, you know, we're so sorry, we thought you were Chinese. Thank you. I'll, I'll start wearing big flag pins now when I check in. Uh, but I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, we had a question. Can you, you identify, identify yourself, yourself please? Uh, yes, Jonathan Chanis, New Tide Asset Management. Thank you for the presentation. I wanted to follow up on Peter's comment on the FCPA and ask, uh, are there things that the U.S. should be doing to combat China and Russia in terms of corruption on the continent? Um, uh, you know, I've often wondered why the U.S. doesn't engage in more naming and shaming about just exposing what's going on to the public in Africa. I mean, I know it has potential implications for regime destabilization in some cases, but we don't seem to be doing much at all in terms of just surfacing the problem. I mean, you know, we have tremendous national technical means. We know a lot about what goes on. The government knows a lot. And we can find out a heck of a lot more if we decided it was a priority. You know, what else could we do, you know, even in terms of naming and shaming and other things? Um, well, we certainly could use the authorities we, that already exist, but the, it's understaffed. Uh, uh, one of the things I did when I was in government was try to get more staffing to the Office of Foreign Asset Control and Treasury. Uh, uh, extra staffing to, because when I, when I was, I think there was one and a half individuals dedicated to Africa there. Uh, I got that bumped up, it took me several years, and everyone, there are people in the room who know the process and the government far better. But then we, conflict broke out in Ukraine, and all of a sudden, the people I got added to were subtracted back out and we're doing Russia sanctions. So, you know, we're, uh, we're back to where it was when I got in. So we're staffing for sanctions and other things, I think, uh, would be helpful. And very often, as Mark said, engaging civil society, one of the most embarrassing things as an American citizen uh, was recently, uh, uh, last year when I was in the Congo, in order to get into our U.S. Embassy to meet with the ambassador, I, I had to weed my way past a bunch of protesters having a, a sit-in in front of the embassy. And the embarrassing part for me personally was I was in full agreement with the protesters. Uh, now, I had an appointment with the ambassador and had to uh, see Ambassador Tavit, but they were protesting the reported and it's about lifting of sanctions against some of the corrupt individuals who have been sanctioned for polluting the country. And we're thinking about, and they were having a sit-in in front of the U.S. Embassy. Uh, and those are, the, those are our allies. We have a, a bunch more questions. I'm going to go to our president, president Paul Saunders, who has had a, he's a been waiting patiently. Thank you very much. I wanted to press both of you a little bit on uh, the, the questions uh, surrounding our values uh, and how we approach our values. Can you speak just a little bit more oh, loudly sorry. for that? I wanted back. To, to, to press you both a little bit on our values and how we deal with our values. And I guess as I think about our, our values, I, I can kind of intellectually divide uh, our, our values into 
multiple categories, but for, for the purposes of, of this conversation, uh, let's talk about democracy, uh, about rule of law, and about human rights, uh, which, which I view as, as three different things. Uh, if I uh, uh, attempt, you know, to the best of my limited ability to put myself in the shoes uh, of someone living in Africa who's a citizen of an African country, uh, you know, somebody could make a persuasive case to me about why the rule of law uh, would be really beneficial to me. And I remember, you know, when I was in the State Department in the Bush administration, we had, I think it was called the Culture of Lawfulness uh, program. Uh, you remember it too, Mark, I can see. You know, tr trying, trying to help uh, uh, people to understand that actually having rule of law helps the little guy. Uh, that, that's kind of your uh, protection, uh, is it, having rule of law. Uh, human rights, uh, I, I, I think uh, I, it, it's, it's easy to understand how uh, human rights can make a, a difference to me in my life. If, it, if I could have additional rights to do, to do this or to do that. In democracy, it gets a little more complicated. It's, at least from my point of view, I think it's a more complicated case to make. Uh, people want to see what's it going to deliver uh, for me in my life. We get into arguments about uh, the United States trying to impose a particular uh, mode of government or to put specific individuals in charge rather than other individuals. Uh, what, what do you think? What do you think? Great that you asked this. First of all, you know, my wife is also a political scientist. Someone in this room was at, at, at the wedding. Um, and she says, well, you, you know, if you're going to do the time, you might as well do the crime. So they know we want to promote democracy. So perhaps we ought to go there. You describe a continuum. You know, there's the good governance, rule of law part. There's the human rights part. And there's democracy. And, you know, it may be that in the next few years, we should not necessarily have democracy highest in the neon lights but you know the connection between all of them it is inevitably what what we're going to and want um to, to promote and by the way there are people in the human rights community for a long time who who did not want to be attached to democracy um, and there's sort of two oddly two communities on that uh, it is interesting that you know the Biden administration has really taken things heavily in a direction of of you know the the d word you want to win? Yeah, just a little bit. I, I, I agree that on um, the continuum. Ideal, uh, you have democracy and rights, the full suite. But I think for most people uh, in Africa in particular, and I, a term I preferred uh, was to talk about state legitimacy. That the government is legitimate because of its protection of its people, what it provides to them. Uh, rather than formal democracy, because there's a lot of cynicism about formal democracy. A good example, you know, there, uh, President Obama uh, had in his first the the, uh, the meeting at the White House of the four African leaders who were at that time qualified as democratically elected. One of whom, you know, I'll go to my grave uh, with a raft of statistics why he was never elected by anybody except perhaps, you know, two two voters, in quotation marks, at the Elysee Palace in Paris. Uh, there was no democracy, and everyone in the country knew it. <laughs> and when we recognize that person as democratic, we just open ourselves up to a lot of cynicism. And so uh, we have to look at what came before. Uh, and so not every coup is against a democratically elected government, uh, not justifying or condoning coups. But if you didn't get there legitimately uh, and you kept power, and don't give people an option to get vote you out. You know, nature they'll 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 find a way to get rid of you, and it won't be the way we preferred. So I think legitimacy is key, and and that I think most people kind of identify with. And you know, if you look at polls, youth want accountability. They want accountability. So the states need to deliver for their people. This is actually one reason I think also that we should in, you know invest in health. Afrobarometer shows that 30 in 39 countries, 
the number, the second thing after unemployment that people want is health. So we should encourage com governments to deliver for their people, invest in their, their people, actually, so that it isn't all US aid. But accountability, and those are the steps down the continuum, but the beginning steps. Angela Stent from Georgetown has a has a question. I have a question as well. Um, <clears throat> first, to Peter Fan's point, um, I was at an exchange student at Moscow State University in the Soviet Union. I, I lived on the same floor as a lot of African students. That was the best way to inoculate them against fondness for the Soviet Union, for Marxism, and for that way of life. The experiences they had there. So. <clears throat> I think, you know, what you were suggesting was, was very good. Um, but I do have a question about our messaging. So I worked on a project uh, last year for the European Command of NATO. We did a series of dialogues with countries in the Global South about Russia and about the Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, one of the things that comes out, including countries in Africa, is there, you know, we talk about our values, but they will immediately come back with hypocrisy. Uh, what do you mean rule of law? You know, and they'll point to something in this country that shows it wasn't. What do you mean democracy, uh, human rights, uh, and why are you talking about Russian aggression? Look what you've done, be it, you know, Vietnam, Afghanistan, you name it. Um, and the other thing is, we haven't done a very good job of countering a massive amount of Russian disinformation on that continent. The people who follow Sputnik, RT, other Russian social media, the Russians have special units targeting African populations um, to spread their to spread their message. So I would say to come back to, to Jamie Rubin's question, we have to do the first thing, which is to the positive um, message that we have for people in Africa, but we also should be directly countering what the Russians say about us and other things they say about themselves. And my sense, at least for in the discussions we had, is that we don't do that. So I don't know. I mean, Mark, you've been head of Freedom House. How can we better do that, uh, mix those things, but also directly take up all of this in disinformation that they get from the Russians? Let me add on to Angela's question. My sense is that many House Republicans, and maybe in the Senate as well, are intent on neutering, if not crippling, our efforts to counter disinformation abroad. So let me go to you first, Peter. Well, do you want to go first? Well, I, just, okay. I, gotta, I gotta contend that it's completely differentiated between China and Russia. There's a horrifying uh, core of people in, in the Republican conference in the House who are open to the idea that, uh, you know, why are we spending so much time on focusing on Russia? They aren't a problem. But there is consensus about China. And even if people want to reduce foreign aid immensely, information programs that relate to China around the world is probably something you'd get Republican support for. So I'd I just think, say it's differentiated. I think it gets to the issue of tech and this this belief that there is in fact a tech conspiracy directed against American conservatives to neuter them politically and they have concocted a variety of well, I've learned conspiracy if there's, theories if you want centering to, around this. Yeah, if you want to find something that every office, Republican or Democrat, agrees with, they hate pharma companies and they hate tech companies. But yes, there is a conservative view that that's a problem. But Jamie, you're, you know, you've been in the business of the, of the press and public diplomacy for a long time. We can't just rely on the private sector, you know, social media. Um, there has to be some U.S. government seeded and strategized messaging of the type you and Angela talk about. Um, and, and so we have to answer that. Well, we're not handing this job over to the tech companies. You know, we need to think about um, shaping if, I, if you will, hearts and minds. Yeah, I'll, I don't want to hijack Angela's question, so I'm going to go to Peter, too. Yeah. No, I, and then I'll go to Jamie. No, I, we, we, we have to do more, and I think disaggregating you know, all of our rivals, competitors, into the separate buckets, I think, is very important. Uh, because the Russian challenge is entirely even not just for things that I've even said about uh, conspiracy theories that you know, people buy into, but also the sophistication 
uh, the memes. I mean, I enjoy sort of, I have to admit, I enjoy sort of the memes and cartoons that African friends send me that are generated probably somewhere outside St. Petersburg. Uh, they're actually very clever. I don't agree with the messaging, but they're clever. And the, the question I would have in the uh, segue to is how we, you know, in the Cold War, we knew how to see these things. And it wasn't just Radio Free Europe and Voice of America. We had sophisticated opera. Not, you know, uh, I'm, I'm open-minded to be convinced, but I'm not quite sure we're, we're up to the task or we've got the, the, the wherewithal to mount the campaign, I think, does need to be, be mounted. Uh, even the resources from Congress were not an issue. Let me jump in there. Uh, look, uh, they, during the Afghan and Iraq war, generals had this various way of talking about it in which they could say that we weren't winning. Um, we're not winning the information war. Um, we're definitely not winning. We're outspent by 10 to 1. Um, the Russians have been doing disinformation since the protocols of the elders of Zion and the, and the, uh, and the uh, czarist period. And the Chinese uh, spend enormous amounts of money, not so much to lie in the way the, Chinese, the Russians do, but just to dominate. Thank you, Angela, for your comments. Uh, look, some there is a small section of the State Department devoted to this task. Uh, we are a, a, a tiny organization and the Republicans are trying to kill it. Not all Republicans, not the ones that want to compete with Russia and China properly, but a small number that believe the, the theory that Jacob was talking about. So um, uh, we're behind. We've been very late to the game precisely because, let's face it, if we're all going to be honest, in the first decade of the information revolution, people thought all these wonderful technologies were going to be to our benefit. They thought there were actually policies to spread Twitter and Facebook and uh, social media companies uh, tech tools to other governments, thinking that they were a tool for spreading truth and democracy when in fact they were uh, have a dark side. They would be the universal solvent. Yeah, and so people so thought that, need a strategy. and so we got rid of the spending, we got rid of the money. Uh, there is a problem in creativity. I would not only blame the government. When's the last time you saw a Chinese villain in a Hollywood movie? Um, there was a time when we all hark back to the Cold War and we saw how, you know, there were a lot of Hollywood movies back then about the Soviet Union. There is not a Chinese villain for money because of money. And until we sort of real, get the, the society to realize that we are losing the information war and to care about it, uh, the pressure won't build on, on Hollywood, uh, the uh, money won't be provided, and we'll be fighting for the scraps of millions uh, while the Russians and the Chinese spend billions. Thank you, Jamie. We have several more questions. I'll start here, right back here. Uh, Natalie Liu with uh, Voice of America. Um, so uh, our questions um, is follow up on um, what Peter was saying about the minerals. Um, can you actually stand up so they can all hear you? Oh. <laughs> uh, to follow up on Peter's uh, comments about minerals, do we have a good grasp of um, mineral transportation routes? That once uh, those uh, the um, material is mined, how does it like whether it's cobalt or other things get from Africa or the DRC from the PRC? So land, sea, the rail, um, a grasp of that. And if the United States were to beef up effort on this front, do we have a, a, a certain advantage or disadvantage over the PRC <coughs> in terms of uh, getting the minerals or the, uh, the raw material to here or to friendly shores where they could be uh, processed? And related to that, and how does the... Um, recent um, conflict on the Red Sea, and etc. affect the population. <coughs> By the way, I uh, came across postings on Chinese social media saying that the spokesperson, this uh, um, Houthis, is actually trained in a Chinese Zhengzhou military <coughs> academy. 
So we're, we're talking about foreign exchanges, uh, students, etc. And China trains these people, and uh, it goes back decades. Uh, you're probably aware, heads of states uh, in Africa, <coughs> these rebels, and they post a picture of this uh, spokesperson in his Chinese, uh, um, you know, in China, in Zhengzhou Military Officers Academy. So uh, I'd like to know more about the um, uh, minerals front. And related to the values question, um, uh, it occurs to me that the last thing we want to do, even though we want to speak the uh, language of Africa, the continent, if we uh, uh, neglect the democracy, human rights, value, the last thing we want to be portrayed or to be seen is a uh, junior league um, candidate following China's footsteps there uh, in Africa just to extract minerals. I think that that's the last thing we want to be seen as. Thank you. Just on minerals, for example, the, to me the strategic challenge of you know, um, access is access supply chains that aren't dominated by any one party. Right now, China has acquired a dominating position uh, in extracting the minerals and then in processing it, so that for a number of uh, minerals, the only option is to buy from China. They can cut it off at any time. Uh, that is the vulnerability. So how do we remedy that? Uh, and that's getting access. And so getting almost any other supplier in there is a, pos a net positive is that breaks up a monopoly. Uh, transportation is an interesting one. One of the programs that the current administration has that I, I salute is the, uh, uh, the, the Partnership for Global uh, Infrastructure Investment, PGII, uh, uh, which uh, was announced two years ago at the, at the G7. And part of that, uh, the first concrete demonstration is this project uh, called the Libido Corridor, which is a corridor from the, the port in uh, Angola on the Atlantic by rail that exists already that needs to be upgraded to the Democratic Republic of Congo and onto Zambia, through which minerals can flow to the Atlantic, then go to market. Uh, it also will bring in energy to make the mining sustainable, telecommunications. It's a whole suite of things, an integrated corridor. Uh, so the, contrast that to how China is shipping or to processing China. A thousand miles on diesel trucks uh, to ports on the Indian Ocean, and then by boat back to China. That's a wonderful way to start the green, the, the carbon footprint of the green minerals. Uh, so this is an, uh, the problem is delivery, and I'll close on this. Uh, a year ago, May 7th, 2023, President Biden at Hiroshima announced uh, not just the, the libido quarter, but the specific components where the U.S. government would contribute to catalyze the private sector. Uh, a year, 13 months and some days later, and we're at the G7 again, uh, the biggest part of that transaction, which was the Af Sun, uh, uh, Sun Africa Power Project of, uh, that would include $900 million in Exim financing, hasn't even yet been presented to the Exim board. Uh, it was announced by the president 13 months ago, and it's no closer to being done. And that's a comparative disadvantage uh, turning you know, a disadvantage, uh, what could have been a major uh, value proposition and advantage on our side. I think Natalie's good question, and the second part of it just prompts something, you know, I'd like to back up and summarize something I said earlier in this way. We need to think first, what do we want in Africa? Then we need to think, what do they want? And make sure that the they isn't just governments, but what the people want. And then we need to think about what can we offer? And a mistake would be to think of what the, does China offer and trying to do that better. We ought to think about what we can offer that is distinct. Um, and so we should fight for the minerals and the access and, and so on. But you know, infrastructure investment you know, shouldn't be what we're offering um, other parts of relationships, technology, and even the accountability rule of law. We've got a bunch of questions, so I'm going to start rolling them together. Okay, right here, and then we'll go right here. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm Andy from the MTO Belgium. Thank you for, uh, for hosting us. Um, so far, we've been talking a lot about the two big rivals, Russia and China. 
Ambassador Fam, you also mentioned some new regional players, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Turkey. Um, those are countries that we have a different relationship with than those big two. Does it also require a different approach? Very quickly. Uh, yes, it does require a different approach, and this is where I was hinting at when I was talking about building new coalitions now for value propositions. Clearly, mobilizing money is not something the U.S. government does very efficiently or even effectively. Uh, that's something uh, in uh, the our friends in the Gulf can do very quickly on a quick decision. And so, you know, there's an example where we're in, uh, I, I know some transactions that are currently occurring uh, that involve the U.S. government facilitating investments by Gulf sovereign wealth funds to dilute the Chinese uh, holdings and a type of free up you know, the, the access. So I think there are things like that, and there, there are a myriad of other things, but yes, a different approach, because they're clearly not necessarily rivals. Uh, they're not necessarily in the same camp as our European friends and, and ally, longtime allies, but I think we can find ways to pragmatically work with them. Next question right down here. Sure, so um, Will Meeker with IRI. Uh, one sort of reflection on messaging and then a question. So the reflection is I think I think there's a, an issue with USG rhetoric, frankly. Um, so the, the case we have to make domestically here and to constituents of Washington, D.C. is sort of the great power check, right? That the, what, what our African partners hear and see with that, though, is that we're just pawns in your game as opposed to actual partners, right? And so I think that we have to sort of figure out how to bring these a little bit closer the way we're talking about it. Um, that's not my question. My question is about the sort of tension, uh, and this kind of gets back to the values question a bit earlier, which is we know private sector investment, particularly from U.S. companies, uh, does better when there's stability. We know stability is furthered by democracy. Um, and, and conversely, instability is further, furthered by autocracy, at least in sub-Saharan Africa. <clears throat> Yet when we're pushing democracy, and we're pushing our values, uh, we're doing it very inconsistently, and we're not achieving much with it. And we saw, to, to use um, uh, Mr. Fahm's point in Niger, what that resulted in, right? Um, we delivered some lines sternly, and we got told, sorry, get out of here. Um, and so we know we can't push too far on the normative side, but conversely, we know we need the normative uh, framework to advance what we actually care about. So how do we resolve this tension? Back one more question in the interest of time, right back here. <coughs> Thanks for what Freedom House does. Yes. And, um, yeah, I just, just want to reiterate what uh, Can you stand up so they can hear you, please? Thank you. I just want to reiterate what you say about the, the, the renegotiation, the, what you as want. You know? I think that is the biggest question that remains unanswered. The conditions that the relationship between U.S. and African countries exist during the peak of World Bank in the 90s is absolutely changed in African context. And I think it is the, U, the African countries looks the presence of U.S. and China as a negotiating power for them. And I think it's really, really what is required is how can U.S. revisit its strategic requirements in Africa be able to reuse that as rebranding itself. And I think with regard to the to the to the to, to that conversation comes, yes, democracy, human rights and governance are key. And most of the US support falls within the software of development, which is institutions, social institutions, governance institution, health service. But people want to be free, want to vote, but people also want to eat. And if we are not able to answer the economic question itself, it will be very difficult to have an impact. China is very much swift on that. What can the U.S. business do? You know, not over exaggerate risks, for instance, to do the business. Not only doing a micro, small pieces of development, but can do a mega project that connects people, for instance. Inter Africa, Africa has an institution very advanced than any other continent with regard to conventions, agreements, including free trade agreement that exists in the continent. Those are all very much opportunities that U.S. can actually leverage to really connect to African people, to reconfigure the relationship that exists. And I think the last thing is, when it comes to disinformation in Africa, um, 
uh, yes, Russia is the top. China is coming, but don't forget Istanbul. Istanbul is very key when it comes to disinformation, but also, you know, countering any democratic narrative, particularly in trans Sahelian regions. And I think, you know, it is very much really needed, forgotten in between the conversation. And I want just to, to, to highlight that. All right, we'll have quick answers, and then I'll come to this side of the room. On that, on that. Misinformation things that Angela and Jamie has raised, you know, it, it, they are spending a lot more money than us, but the fact is it's still asymmetrical warfare. It's a lot uh, cheaper to be able to cause confusion or, or spread misinformation. To answer, I'm delighted that the Center for National uh, uh, in the Center for uh, the National Interest, we have strong voices from IRI and Freedom House. I, I, I want to answer your questions together by saying, A, you know, the, the, the sort of liberal model um, or neoliberal model that the reason you should have open political institutions is it yields more economic growth. We need to demonstrate that connection um, again. To answer your question, I just say we should lean in the direction of consistency. Um, it's hard. The U.S. foreign policy, you know, with 50 plus countries in the continent, is unlikely to do so. But the hypocrisy question um, is is an issue, and it's better to be more consistent in speaking up for our values. At least they'll know where we're coming from. Yeah, I would just say very quickly. I think I agree with Mark's earlier point that how do we between our interests and what Africans are. And I think we, we have certain synergies. China's, like I don't know, uh, throughout Africa is extraction and processing back in China. Uh, let's face it, the re political reality is, and one can argue the causes, et cetera, we're not going to do much processing here in America. You know, no one wants a rare earth, and I said more of a rare earth, guy. no one wants a rare earth refining project next to their backyard. Uh, we're not going to do it. Uh, Permitting will take you 15 years on average. Uh, you can do it after you do it cleanly. You have to do it, and I'm not, I'm not saying there, but you can get it done. And that allows Africa also to capture more of the value chain. Uh, and so it's, in a way, their desire for the value chain, our desire to get access. Our key is access, not necessarily doing uh, right. And I think th those are examples, and long find others, where uh, there are synergies between what's wanted by African people and governments and what we can deliver. Well, we got a bunch of questions here. I'm going to lump them together. First, Dan. So I'm Daniel McCarthy from uh, Modern Age. My question mostly for Mark, but I'd be interested in Peter's response as well. I take Mark's point that you can approach the people of Africa as well as approaching particular regimes, but I do notice that whenever a regime that is different from our own approaches the American people uh, and sidesteps the government, we perceive that as a threat to our election integrity and a threat to our values. Why would an African leader, especially one whose form of government is not the same as ours, not look at your approach of going to directly to his people as being inherently subversive? Let, let me go get some more questions. Mark Katz. Right, thank you very much. Uh, I'm just wondering, do you see Russia and China as partners or competitors in Africa? Mm -hmm. Sort of there's a common observation that China wants stability, but Russia thrives on instability. Do they have different uh, agendas, and uh, to what extent you know can we do something about it? And then I guess secondly, you know, I hear so much about what Russia and China are doing. Do they are they ten foot tall, or do they have vulnerabilities? And one of the things that strikes me is that the Russians have replaced the French in the Sahel because Sahelian governments were unhappy that the French weren't defeating the jihadists. Well, can the Russians, with far fewer people, can they do it? And what happens if they can? It strikes me that, that they are on a, they set themselves a very difficult mission. And I think with the China as well, I mean, people talk about this debt trap. Well, you know, in the past, we have lent money, it's not been repaid. The Soviets, this has not been repaid. I mean, do the Chinese not risk not being repaid? And if you try to, if you try to get tough with the, the debtors, there's a reaction that's not going to be beneficial. Uh, was collecting the debt might, uh, <coughs> might be you know, not necessarily in your interest to do it in such a heavy-handed manner. I'm just sort of wondering, do they have vulnerabilities? Um, it's not even a question of whether we can play against them, but that are they, are they acting against their own interests? Two more. One right here. 
<coughs> yeah, thanks, Peter Martin from Weinberg. I lived for eight years in Beijing and I moved to Nairobi this summer. Um, I wanted to ask, you know, obviously in a world of unlimited resources, the US would compete with China and Russia equally everywhere, but that's not the world we live in. So which states in Africa would you identify as the areas where the US can't afford to lose its competition? That was our penultimate question. Now we have the ultimate question. Sorry, uh, Randall, this is the director of the African program at the Carnegie Endowment for International I know we're running out of time, but I wanted to share a few reflections for the kind of to consider. So they're not exactly questions. Um, and this is going on uh, research that we do, and then our engagement with a lot of uh, African intellectuals and policy makers. Uh, my sense is that uh, for a lot of Africans, uh, they understand that we're now in a new era of great power competition, so great power rivalry is not really a problem, and I'm not sure there's any value in trying to hide it from them. That we are just trying to compete. That is not the problem. They can read, you know, they listen to discussions that are happening, so they know that this is going on. Uh, I do think that it's the value proposition that is that really needs to be thought through carefully, and there are a couple of uh, points here. So the first is uh, uh, what a lot of people have said already about really understanding what Africans want, uh, whether it's going on survey data from Afrobarometer, and consistently it shows that people want economic development um, uh, in various ways, jobs, uh, increased incomes, etc. Uh, but when you look at uh, US engagement on the continent, the tools, the financing, the direction it's headed, it's not necessarily aligned with what a lot of African countries want. And I want to give you a specific example here just because I've been looking at the data over the past couple of days. When you look at uh, uh, US bilateral development assistance to the continent in FY 2022, I think it amounted to um, uh, a total of, uh, I think it might have been uh, maybe $17 billion or so, look at the numbers. But out of that, a good 30% goes to health assistance, another 30% goes to humanitarian assistance. So that's 60% plus going to uh, very kind of social sectors. For health assistance, when you disaggregate the data even further, 90% of US bilateral health assistance goes to infectious diseases and reproductive health. Uh, you can keep breaking down the data further to find out what actually gets to African countries. It's a tiny minuscule. Uh, which is completely at dissonance with what a lot of countries need. And this is not investment in like pharmaceuticals or health supply chains or jobs generating endeavors, right? Um, what uh, uh, Mark mentioned about education, visas, etc., those are all good and should be done. Uh, a key comparative advantage of the U.S. is private capital. There's like trillions of private capital all over finding ways to deploy that to different parts of Africa and maybe even the global south for investments in areas that are needed, you know, refining and processing of minerals. Uh, uh, I understand they need to counter this information and better messaging, but there are really hard limits to that. Uh, we are in 2024. We're not in, uh, you know, 1970, whatever, when Hollywood was the top entertainment industry. A lot of African countries now have homegrown entertainment industries. When you go to a lot of countries now, they watch Nigerian movies, they listen to African music. Uh, messaging is just not going to be as effective as it was previously. That's just the hard truth. You know, the world has changed. It's something that I would like to highlight on that front. And also, yes, there's Russian disinformation, but beyond the Sahel, a lot of Anglophone countries watch BBC and CNN. They're not watching RT or you know, going to study in the U.S. So I think there is a, a reorientation that needs to happen here domestically before we get to messaging and narratives, which brings me to my final point. And I think it's been alluded to by a number of people. I think there's a fundamental tension in the values-driven approach of the U.S. Um, and this is on several fronts. So on one front, it's yes, I understand and I appreciate and acknowledge the, the, the importance of democracy and human rights. <laughs> but uh, I think what we hear from a lot of countries is the inconsistencies. And the inconsistencies, they used to be like a minor annoyance that you could ignore. Now it's very difficult to ignore them because 
countries are now comparing themselves with India, for example, you know, Kashmir in India, and people are like, okay, you know, however which way you feel about India, why are they not getting the same treatment? Um, other countries as well. And then also domestically, what we're hearing from a lot of African countries, and I want to mention Ghana here in particular, is that they feel that a controversial policy that might have gone through a very democratic process is then, you know, they are, they are treated in a punitive manner because of that. And in the case of Ghana, they had something that went through what they would call a deliberative process in their parliament. The parliament passed it. It's now waiting at the pre on the president's table for him to, accept, to enact it into law, but he's kind of in a bind. If he does it, he gets the hammer from his partners in the West. Uh, uh, if, he, if he does not do it, and this is this I've been told, it's going to cost his party at the election. Uh, it has now become an electoral campaign issue that if he does not ascend to that law, his party is likely to use. Yes, exactly. So then to that question about the perception that uh, you know people feel that something that might be controversial, but it's what the people in the country want is uh, you know getting a, a punitive uh, reaction elsewhere. Uh, is something that really needs to be thought through. And then finally, on a liberal economic policy, it's also another area that has now become very, very salient. I mean, now we're in the era of industrial policy. A lot of countries, for two, three decades, have been used to um, adopt liberal economic thinking and that has now shifted. So those are a couple of thoughts that I'd like to share. On the interest, we're going to have quick responses from Mark and Peter, and we're going to conclude our session. I'd love to have a separate conversation with you about whether the United States can have any response to a Ghanaian law that's like the Ugandan law on punitive treatment of LGBT persons. Uh, Daniel, thank you for your question. Uh, I only object to interference uh, by, by other countries when it's China and, and Russia and the United States. But to your good question about African leaders, they already perceive civil society or treat them like an opposition. In ostensibly democratic countries, you know, the, the civil society people we work with on global health issues are, are, are treated as opposition or marginalized. It's, a, it's an inherent problem, but I, I, don't, I don't think, I think we still need to engage um, civil society. Continuing with the motif of using my current um, field of health to demonstrate things, Mark, I'm glad you asked the question about can others deliver on counterterrorism better than the Russians, for instance? I mean, it's worth thinking about um, what we can, you know, whatever I say about our values and democracy, we have to deliver as a counterterrorism partner. And we should remember also ways that we derive cooperation from them on counterterrorism. You know, there was a, a demonstrable impact of PEPFAR during the Bush administration on getting more cooperation on counterterrorism. And even, you know, we stood up AFRICOM in the period um, that. We were launching PEPFAR, uh, and and that, you know, facilitated cooperation from them. Finally, I just say, whatever you do, if you think about soft power, persuasive power instruments other than military or security ones, the dumbest thing we can do is to deconstruct things that we have been doing that engage the African people and deliver for them. To cut PEPFAR or cut investment in the Global Fund would be nuts in this geostrategic environment. And we can do it in a different way. We can think to pick up on your, your point, let's not just have the single disease focus of AIDS, TB, and malaria. Let's try and use, use those platforms for broader health goals um, you know, of, of health systems and, and something that delivers broadly. And um, there are ways of doing the health programs that serve Africans' interests, like supporting regional manufacturing of drugs and the commodities um, in these health programs. Peter, you have the final word. Okay. Uh, you know, one has to be, uh, thank you uh, again, Jacob, for this forum. I would say, you know, it's, it's amazing how much our adversaries' competitors take advantage of our own self goals uh, and how little uh, they have to invest to create a lot of angst and mischief. Uh, and, and some of our self-goals are really the failure to listen. 
uh, how did Russia get, how did Va Russia and then the Wagner Group get into the Central African Republic? It was uh, over, uh, who, no, one, no one was willing to provide minimal arms to the internationally recognized government to protect itself when it controlled little more, not even that, of the capital city. So the Russians happily came in and uh, pretty soon not only provide protection for the president, but his national security advisor, a guy named Zakharov, wonderful Central African name. Uh, uh, and, you know, how did they get into Mali? Uh, you know, the coup occurred in Mali uh, in August 2020. They, Wagner, did, the Russians and Wagner didn't show up until more than almost 18 months later. It was when the U.S. refused a ITAR license uh, for a military-grade transponder to a unarmed crop plane built in Spain that uh, the military wanted to buy because they only had one transport plane and it was five years overdue for maintenance. Uh, uh, they wanted to buy a plane, not a gift, not aid. They just needed a license for the transponder. We denied the license. Uh, the foreign minister came to Washington. He'd been ambassador for seven and a half years begged for the a reconsideration, got a second no, and the following month at UN General Assembly had a conversation with Sergei Lavrov, and Sergei invited him to Moscow. We have planes, we have other things, and the rest is history. So uh, it's the self goals. Very quickly, there are divergences between Russia and China. That's why I keep saying we have to disaggregate these. Uh, there are cases where it's been swept in the interests of their internal alliance, swept under the rug, but there are cases in Central African Republic that, you know, where Chinese businesses and have been threatened, in, in one case, by my, the management of a mine killed by uh, uh, <coughs> ex-Wagner uh, affiliates and the mine taken over. So they have conflicted, swept under the rug, but that's something to another day. Final point I will make is we often conflate, the government is just a small part of this. Uh, we often conflate official uh, foreign assistance for the whole family of what uh, U.S., our own civil society does, volunteer association, philanthropies, and businesses do. And so our resources are far greater. Government's resources to do what, you know, provide those common goods that uh, the private sector can't provide or to catalyze. And so we need to keep that, you know, in a way, a whole of America approach is the way to, to ultimately win this for ourselves and win it for our, our African friends. Strong words. Thank you, both of you. Thank you.